Will you please welcome our next fake TED Talk presenter? Strap in, folks. It's Matt Fraction. You guys had a couple with dinner, huh? So Your Majesty's Secret Service is the best James Bond film, and I can prove this empirically. First time someone told me this, I did not believe them. It was made, it was released in 1969. Nice. Richard, uh, written by Richard Maybaum, uh, uh, who wrote four other uh, Bond movies, five, is that right, four? Anyway, and a novelist named Simon Raven, who's named Simon Raven. Uh, Michael Reed, who was the second unit of a bunch of Bond movies with cinematographers, edited by John Glenn, who would go on to direct like all the Roger Moores. And it was directed by this fellow, Mr. Peter Hunt. He was the editor on the first four Bond films, and he became director on the first five Bond films, sorry, he became director on this one. Oh my god, I have to turn to my fan club card. Uh, and while being an editor, of those films, he invented what we consider modern action editing, speed ramping, cutting the montage, jump cuts, all the tricks you see in Bourne or John Wick. It's stuff that Peter Hunt came up with, trying to figure out a way how to make Bond movies more exciting. He also wears good hats, and this is a stop. Uh, he cut a film called The Ipcris File, which were the, was uh, Harry Salzman, Bond producer's attempt to do like a blue collar, not eaten asshole uh, uh, James Bond. It starred Michael Caine. Uh, uh, yeah, Michael Caine is a spy. Uh, and Peter Hunt edited that. A guy named Sidney Fury directed it. It is my favorite DVD commentary of all time because neither of them have seen the film or one another since opening night in 1966. <laughs> And at one point, Sidney Fury goes, Did you ever do anything? <laughs> <laughs> Directed their own the Majesty Secret Service. Oh, good for you! <laughs> it's amazing. <laughs> so why does Honor Majesty Secret Service have a bad reputation? I'm glad you asked, because that is my TED Talk. <laughs> it's got a 142 minute running time. It's the longest Bond film until Casino Royale. And now Bond films are all very long because they all cost half a billion dollars, and Sam Mendes has a lot to say about grim British sadness. Uh, no Time to Die is two hours and 43 minutes, so if it is ever released, don't have coffee at any point, because you're gonna miss the middle. Uh, so it's long. Now, children, before there were streaming, if you wanted to see a movie, you couldn't just pull out a phone or summon it onto a screen somewhere. You had to rent a DVD. Before that, there were tapes, VHS cassettes. Uh, uh, and sometimes you just couldn't see a film if it was never rebroadcast. So ABC broadcast on Her Majesty's Secret Service once as an ABC Sunday night movie event. And they cut it into two parts. It ran over two nights. They re-edited it. And they gave it a voiceover, which made zero sense. <laughs> so if you missed it the first time around, and you caught it this time around, you're like, that fucking sucks. Total church. It's a bummer. We're gonna get to that later. There's also poor key art. Now that's what you call like posters and promotional material. And I'm saying this as someone who deeply loves James Bond key art. The entire campaign was based around the fact that this was gonna be the first movie that Sean Connery was not in. Who possibly could fill the, the shoes of James Bond? Who's the new Bond gonna be? Maybe not the best idea to make that the marketing point around which your, your, your plan pivots, because everything was about the mystery of who this guy was, and how could you possibly beat Sean Connery? Even if he has no visible muffin top, which is really something. <laughs> For the first time, James Bond is being presented to the world as someone as faceless and anonymous as all the women in James Bond films to that point. <laughs> which brings me to this. Now, there are a myriad of sins against empathy and common sense, and ration and reason and love in these films and the books, which are even worse somehow. They are racist, sexist, xenophobic, homophobic, uh, colonial, imperial, uh, uh, arrogant, smug, uh, uh, and almost cynically white. Uh, uh, I have a complicated relationship with the material uh, and have 
taken to viewing it a little bit like one's racist grandmother at Thanksgiving. <laughs> I'm glad she's there. And somewhere I do love her. I really wish she'd shut the fuck up. <laughs> so this is the final key art they went with. Not good. <laughs> and someone somewhere was like, well, how are they gonna know he's James Bond? I know, we'll put him in a tuxedo. On the skis? Damn it, Craig, it'll work. <laughs> so the cat's out of the bag, and this is George Lazenby's first and only appearance as James Bond. <laughs> he was 29 years old when he got the gig. He was a fashion model and a, a TV pitch man. He bluffed his way into the job. He uh, went to where Connery got his haircut and said, give me a Sean Connery haircut. He went to uh, the tailor for the James Bond films and wanted to have a suit cut there. He's like, well, I've got this one Sean didn't want. He was like, give me that one and cut it for me. And then he just showed up and he walked in the office. He goes, gentlemen, you found your James Bond. And they said, well, come in and have a seat. He said, no, thanks. And he went over to the window and lit a cigarette and leaned there the entire time. <laughs> So he gets the gig, and a couple days before filming, he says to Peter Hunt, I need to tell you before cameras start rolling, I've never acted before. <laughs> I... Sorry. And Peter Hunt laughed his ass off and said, you fooled the two most important producers in Hollywood to get this gig. You can act great. <laughs> I think these reasons were why I never saw it as a kid. It was sort of the Bond movie that my dad, who would always have a Bond film on if they were on to be seen, would disregard. Like, it wasn't real, it didn't count, because he wasn't actually Bond. For, or, and it was long, and it was confusing, all this other shit. So, it comes out December 18th, 1969, and makes $62.4 million, which is successful, but it wasn't as successful as Thunderball, uh, which was the highest grossing Bond film until Skyfall. Um, and it got a bad rap. Lazenby was difficult and quit uh, uh, before the movie came out. It quit being James Bond, uh, deciding Bond was stuffy and uh, uh, he was counterculture. Um, reviews were tepid, everything was a mess. But I am telling you, this movie is a goddamn gem. <laughs> this is my simple mnemonic for remembering it. It begins with O. Oh my god, are you fucking kidding me? Because that's what you're going to say when I tell you what this movie's about. We start with a mystery man, still reminding us, you're not watching Sean Connery. Uh, stopping a beautiful woman from committing suicide. He is stopped by two thugs, clearly charged with protecting the woman. He walks to camera, enters into light for the first time, and says, this never happened to the other fellow. Reminding us yet again. We're not watching Sean Connery. So, finding her later, Bond pays off her gambling debts and discovers she's still engaging in reckless suicidal behavior, like having sex with James Bond. <laughs> This brings me to point two of our mnemonic device. Holy shit, is that Dame Diana Rigg? <laughs> yes. And I would argue she was the first Bond woman, fresh from the Avengers, and she's fucking amazing in this movie. Uh, so, firmly ensconced in 1969, James Bond is confronted by the thugs again and escorted to meet Tracy in his best orange turtleneck. <laughs> Diana Rigg's character's name is Tracy, by the way. Uh, goes to her, uh, abducted to her father's villa, where he discovers that Tracy's father is international crime syndicate mastermind, Mark Draco. Draco implores Bond, not as a criminal, but as a father, to please watch after his mentally disturbed daughter and protect her, stop her from taking her own life, make her fall in love with life again, and if he can, he'll pay Bond a million dollars or something. I don't know. Okay, so, Bond is now gonna hang out with Tracy and keep her safe and keep her alive. While they do this, the two of them fall in love which we all watch in a wonderful montage where the Bond uh, theme song, the music plays. What is that song? Music? Yeah. This would be has some fucking music. <laughs> Bond songs can be great. Live and Let Die, All Time High, Nobody Does It Better, Goldfinger, fucking terrible. Anything Pierce Brosnan was in. <laughs> it's true, come on. Uh, uh, so who did the Bond song for Honor Majesty's Secret Service? Louis Goddamn Armstrong. <laughs> Satchmo himself. The song is called All the Time in the World. It was one of the last songs he recorded. He was too ill to play the trumpet, but it's still Louis, and it's still fucking great. 
I think I forgot to mention that James Bond is a secret agent. Alright, buckle up. Because shit's about to go off. Bond is frustrated with MI6 because they won't let him go after Blofeld, who's his arch-rival and the leader of terrorist organization Spectre. Draco gets a lead on Blofeld's location. Apparently, I swear to God I'm not making this up, Blofeld has been living under the alias of a Count du Blochamp in the Swiss Alps, <laughs> running a scientific research facility. In parallel to this, Blofeld apparently has been in, in touch with the London uh, College of Arms, trying to prove that he is in fact a descendant of the du Blochamp lineage that would make him an actual blood count. Now, there are a lot of ways this can be told, some family research, old documents, family graves, stuff like that, but the most telling is if Blofeld, or Blochamp, has the du Blochamp family birth defect, a lack of earlobes. <laughs> if only we could see him and determine whether or not he had earlobes, <laughs> is actually a thing that happens. So, Bond is going to infiltrate Blofeld's uh, a scientific research facility, pretending to be this guy, who is 4,000 years old, and in the movie is named Sir Hilary Bray. Sir Hilary Bray! He has a voice like this! <laughs> Sounds like an old British guy. He's going to cram everything he can. Uh, he has to study about what genealogy and all this stuff is, which is a thing we kind of never get to see. Bond is always presented as like a smug, know-it-all, eaten asshole, right? And then this, he's like, he's got to study. Um, and it ends up being the thing that trips him up later on. Uh, uh, but a creative choice is made, not because of anything with Lazenby's performance, it's just a bad creative choice, where once Bond is undercover as Hilary Bray, they're gonna dub the old man's voice over Lazenby's mouth. Oh. Yeah. <laughs> this occupies the entire second act of the film, which is like an hour of screen time. The new James Bond is talking like Hilary <laughs> doesn't help. Now, behold, Piz Gloria, that's Piz, P-I-Z, not Piz Gloria, that's another movie. <laughs> uh, which actually is real, and it is fantastic, and the Bond uh, unit uh, built what you see there, which is a helicopter pad, to ensure that they could use it. It still exists, you can get a room there, it's a ski lodge, they have an Honor Majesty's Secret uh, Service museum and shit. And here, the Dublochamp is the Dublochamp Allergy Clinic where Blofeld has been endeavoring to eliminate otherwise fatal food allergies in these 12 beautiful women who live here all alone with no men. Enter James Bond. Who shall, with the Count's blessing, work to establish his legitimacy as a du Blochamp, uh, uh, while the Count works to cure these dark food allergies. And now, here's the last point of the mnemonic when we get to Blofeld. Because he is... Yeah. Son of a bitch, is that Telly Savalas? <laughs> yes. Yes, it is. So, Bond seduces two Bond girls the same night using the same lines. <laughs> and discovers that Blofeld is, in fact, using this bizarre hypnosis program to brainwash the girls to become his angels of death. This is a POV shot, by the way. The hypnosis will send them out into the world as suicide bombers to unleash a string of biological terror attacks across the world simultaneously at Christmas. Did I mention it's a Christmas movie? <laughs> so Bond barely escapes in the first of two amazing ski sequences, uh, uh, one of which killed one of the small guys. Uh, uh, they put it in the movie. Uh, well, that's what stunt guys want. That's the stunt guy thing. Blame stuntmen. Not, I have nothing to do. Ask the stunt guys. I have nothing to do with this. But anytime you've ever seen a movie where a stunt guy dies, you've seen the stunt guy dies. Uh, okay, so they have the little foot, hill of the mountains. The bad guys follow. They surround the exit. Bond is surrounded by civilians. Bad guys are closing in, looking to kill him. And here we see something that six Bond movies have failed to show us. James Bond feeling fear. He is hunted and cornered and alone. And Lazenby plays it like he is a caged animal. He's the only guy who knows that he's standing between the death of millions and, you know, Christmas, I guess. Uh, uh, and I think it really is not until Daniel Craig that we get a bond like this, who ever shows this kind of uh, humanity, right? Mazafuck. <laughs> 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 
<laughs> that, was, that was Timothy Dalton. Oh, God damn it! <laughs> I thought I could forget! I thought the joke would be enough. <laughs> so, there's another song in the film. It was written by uh, Hal David, uh, performed by Swedish pop chantrus Nina. It's called Do You Know How Christmas Trees Bloom? Uh, I didn't, I'm sorry, I know that you all are Nina super fans. I don't want to Nina explain to you, but so. But it's in the film. And the lyric, in case you've forgotten, uh, goes In winter rain, uh, the tree will freeze and Christmas trees will die. Do you know how Christmas trees are grown? They need sunshine and raindrops, uh, friendship and kindness, and all of this is playing while Bond is basically having a panic attack on the bench. <laughs> and most of all, they need love, the song goes. And who should find him here but sent by her father to help him if he needs it? Boom! Tracy! Diana Rigg! And she saves his fucking life. Driving her car across a frozen ice pond, chased by bad guys, through Al Alpine Road, Bond and Tracy escape. And the glee with which Diana Rigg has in playing Demolition Derby with these assholes is fantastic. Uh, uh, and my favorite part of the movie. Uh, so they escape, realizing he's met not just his equal, but his better. James Bond proposes to her, and she accepts, and he is going to quit MI6 and marry her. Things go wrong. Tracy gets captured. MI6 refuses to help Bond get her back, even though they know where Blofeld is. Bond can only go to Draco, and teaming up with a mafia dude, Bond and Draco invent Apocalypse Now <laughs> and take shit to Piz Gloria themselves, shooting to fucking kill. Blofeld creeps. Tracy fights back. The cavalry arrives. This thing explodes, and that somehow stops the allergy girls from their stuff. I don't know. Uh, there's a luge race, the stuntman thing happens, and it's bad. And Bond and Blofeld are fighting in a luge that is literally going 60 miles an hour until Blofeld's neck snaps between a forked branch of a tree. The bad guys die. The good guys have won. And now all that's left is the wedding of James Bond. <laughs> Money Penny catches the bouquet. That's, that's, that's really sweet. Uh, driving off. Bond pulls the car over to remove the excessive flowers from the Austin Martin DBS. Maybe it's because it's hard to see. Maybe it's toxic masculinity. <laughs> All the same. Yeah! The film ends with James Bond in shock holding his wife's corpse, and as the first responders rush over to him, he insists, she's fine, she's only resting. We have all the time in the world, you see. Merry Christmas! <laughs> I propose that if this had been made in 1967 instead of 1968, were it Sean Connery and he was happy to be Bond, were it still the 60s and not the 70s, that Honor Majesty's Secret Service would be the Empire Strikes Back of the Bond series, not just the high point creatively, but empirically, the place where the genre elements that drive the film as a piece of entertainment combined with actual human stuff, and pathos, and tragedy, giving us a, a relatable-ish stakes and a real uh, emotional punch behind its fantastic rap. Uh, instead, no one ever watches Honor Majesty's Secret Service but me, and you now get me telling you about it here. Thank you. Matt Fraction! Thank you very much. Give it up once again for Chris and Dana.